Time to take a look at German artillery tactics in World War II. Now in this video I rely mostly on primary sources, since there are few books on this subject. As such a big thank you to all my supporters on PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar that make research like this possible. Now artillery, unlike infantry or tanks, was first and foremost a supporting arm. This becomes very apparent when we look at the role of the artillery defined in the official regulations. The artillery's task is to use the force of its fire to smash the enemy's forces in time and thereby help the friendly infantry to victory. Before we go into the nitty gritty on how to set up a position and how to support an attack, we need some basics. This video deals with divisional artillery, which is concentrated in the artillery regiment and for a 1939 infantry division usually consists of three light artillery battalions and one heavy artillery battalion. Each battalion consists of 12 howitzers, as such 48 howitzers in total. The light battalions were ideally equipped with the 105mm Leichte Feldhobitze 18, the light field howitzer, whereas the heavy battalions were equipped with the 150mm Schwere Feldhobitze 18, heavy field howitzer. Note that the 18 was a cover name, these howitzers were not from World War I. As you can probably tell, the artillery battalion was the core tactical unit. The battalion is the fire unit. The battalion commander directs the fire of his batteries by combat tasks, from which it must be clear which target, at which time and with which ammunition employment is to be fought. So what was the role of the light howitzers? They would engage living and soft targets. Targets protected by field fortifications were also common. Additionally, they were also intended and used for anti-tank combat, especially in the early years of the war. In combination with proper reconnaissance, light howitzers could also be used for engaging enemy artillery. Yet this was the main role of the heavy howitzers, that were commonly used for counter-battery fire. This was due to their longer range and also greater destructive potential. It is also particularly suitable for destroying equipment such as guns, field fortifications and wire obstructions. Since the main role of the artillery was supporting the infantry or tanks, each artillery battalion had an Artillerieverbindungskommando an artillery liaison command detachment. Such a detachment was usually assigned to an infantry or a tank unit, for instance to an infantry battalion, which was located at the center of gravity during an attack. Let's get a bit more technical here, so let's look at an artillery shell. One important aspect of those shells were the different fuses due to their major influence on the weapons effect. The main types of fuses were the impact fuse without delay, which had two variants, regular and sensitive, so you don't get a skin rash. Next was the impact fuses with delay and finally the combination fuses or doppelzünder. Now the more interesting question here is what fuse to use against which target. Now for that we ideally look at the weapons effect. So an impact fuse without delay will explode on impact, which usually means that the shell will penetrate the ground to a certain degree. As a result some of the shell fragments will be swallowed by the ground. And some sensitive fuse might be more advisable. In this case, the majority of the fragmentation will be delivered outwards, whereas with an impact fuse with delay, the resulting explosion will be caught mostly in the surrounding terrain. So at first glance, it seems that against targets in the open, the sensitive impact fuse might be the best. Yet this is only one part of the picture. Because with a proper angle and conditions of the ground, we might actually get the best effect against targets in the open with the delayed fuse. Now how is this possible? Well we might achieve an abpraller, a ricochet. In this case the projectile will bounce off the ground and explode literally in mid-air, which can result in the most devastating fragmentation effect against uncovered targets in the open. Now another situation when a delayed fuse might be very practical is against dug-in targets. As you can see now, the impact fuses without delay and the one with the sensitive fuse would only do minor to limit the damage on this type of fortification, whereas the delayed fuse would penetrate deep enough before it explodes to allow the destruction of the fortification. Yet what about the doppelzünder, the combination fuse? How did it work and what was its role? While well, a combination fuse or a literally translated double fuse had basically two ways to explode. It had a timer that could be set and would lead to the explosion and also an impact fuse. It was mainly used for adjustment fire and due to limited numbers should normally not be used in fire for effect, unless the nature of the terrain is unlikely to have an effect with an impact fuse, 
for instance in mountainous or marsh terrain or in deep snow. Now since we got that covered, let's look at the basic types of fire, which were Störungsfeuer, harassing fire, Notfeuer, which is a standing barrage, Zerstörungsfeuer, destruction fire, and Vernichtungsfeuer, annihilation fire. Note that the latter is in some cases not listed. Additionally, the creeping barrage is noted with some sources as well, but I omitted it here. Now harassing fire is about annoying the enemy to such a degree that his combat effectiveness is reduced. And one author makes a very interesting point. Commit harassing fire sadistically. Where and when would it be most unpleasant on our own side? No regularity. Let surprise fire alternate with single shots by roving guns and roving batteries. Next was the standing barrage. This was used to provide a timely and spatially limited fire during an enemy attack. As the original name Notfire, literally emergency fire, suggests. If this fire was carefully planned and in coordination with the infantry, especially with its heavy weapons. This meant it should be focused on areas that could not be covered by the infantry's heavy weapons, like the infantry support guns, mortars and heavy machine guns. In case of a direct line of sight to the enemy, it should only be fired at the positions where the enemy was located. To get a better idea on what areas should be assigned to which weapons, be sure to check out my video on defensive tactics, which includes some examples from wartime reports. Another type of fire was destruction fire, Zerstörungsfeuer. The main goal was to destroy the target. The requirement for proper destruction fire was that the target was identified by observation. Now the next type is similar in name, namely Annihilation Fire, which is not mentioned in any of my pre-war sources, but only in the one from 1942, which includes wartime experience. It notes, Annihilation Fire, a fire concentration of as many batteries as possible with a fixed duration under circum circumstances expressed as surprise fires, at the highest speed of fire and with simultaneous commencement of fire. Purpose? to smash enemy deployments and preparations for attack or defense. To preserve the surprise, avoid adjustment fire as much as possible. So basically destruction fire is against individual identified targets, whereas annihilation fire is about hitting an area with an enemy troop concentration with little to no adjustment fire. Next are three interesting points about the use of artillery that are crucial and provide a deeper understanding. First off, it is important to remember that artillery fulfills various roles that many might not be aware of. Probably one of the most interesting examples is about the role of the artillery in the advance guard during the march. Generally, the advance guard of an infantry division marching on the road is assigned a light artillery battalion. Second, as mentioned often in my video, combined arms warfare is good for you. And the key requirement for this is proper communication and understanding of the individual arms. As such, the army regulation notes explicitly, effective fire support for the infantry is only ensured if there is a constant mutual communication between the infantry and artillery leaders, and if it is clearly stated how the infantryman will lead the battle, when and where he wants to have the artillery fire, when the artillery is ready to fire, and where it can act with or without observation. Third, this becomes even more apparent if we take a look at the weapons of the infantry and the artillery. The infantry weapons are mostly direct fire weapons, thus ideally suited to engage the enemy in the open, whereas howitzers are first and foremost indirect fire weapons, thus ideally suited to engage the enemy behind cover. Hence, coupling for flat trajectory fire and high angle fire results in the strongest fire effect. The flat trajectory weapons hit the enemy who shows himself outside of cover. The high angle weapons grab the enemy inside and behind cover. Now let's take a look at how artillery would support an infantry attack. Here we have a symbolic enemy position. Generally during attack, the artillery focuses firing on the enemy infantry and artillery. Both must be engaged during the whole duration of the attack. Other targets might be engaged as well, yet usually only for a short period of time. Before the attack, unless the commander holds back the artillery for a surprise attack, it engages identified enemy artillery batteries, troop movements, and other identified targets. Yet at this point the focus is engaging the enemy artillery. Once the friendly infantry begins with the attack, the focus switches to the enemy infantry. Additionally, targets that slow down the attack should be engaged as well. Engaging them with concentrated fire is key to sustaining the momentum of the attack. Shortly before the friendly infantry achieves a penetration into the enemy line, 
it might be necessary to engage enemy targets near the point of penetration. Hierbei it is important to use concentrated fire. As such, it might be necessary for the commander to withdraw temporary artillery support for units that are not engaged at the point of penetration. Additionally, it is crucial that the artillery is able to engage new targets, threatening the penetration from the depth or the flanks. After successful penetration, it is important that the artillery continues to support the advance of the infantry. Thus, enemy artillery and forces in the depth needs to be engaged. Any targets that might slow down the infantry must be engaged with concentrated fire as well. This will usually be done with forward observers of the batteries that are attached to the infantry units. So before we conclude this video, let us look at an example for a battery position and a firing position for an individual gun. Let's begin with the battery position. Here would be the location of our infantry. Slightly behind the forward observation point is located in our example. Further to the back was the main observation point. Whereas behind the cover of the hill, the battery would be in firing position. Finally, the limber position would be back in the woods. Note that it was paramount that the observation point and the firing position would be connected with two independent communication links. So in case one was out of action, that the operations could proceed with only minor interruption. Now, how would an individual gun position for a light field howitzer look like? One example given is the following. The area of the gun should be around 5 meters wide and 6 meters in length. The position would be about 0.4 meters deep, yet the trenches would deepen with 1.25 meters on the left and 1.1 meter on the right side. Additionally, there would be locations for ammunition at various points located on the right side, whereas dugouts for personnel would be located on the left. The estimated man hours were 110 hours, so 22 hours for 5 men. A crucial element for artillery was of course camouflage, yet as always it followed the principle of Wirkung vor Deckung, firepower first, cover secondary. To quote, however, camouflage must never take precedence over effect. This means the actual combat activity of the troops must never suffer under camouflage considerations. To summarize, the main role of the artillery was to support the infantry and or tanks. To achieve this role, a deep understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of the different arms was required. Similarly, during combat, clear and constant communication was paramount. Since the activity of both weapons, infantry and artillery, cannot be separated temporarily and spatially during any battle. As such, each artillery battalion had a liaison detachment. Furthermore, each artillery battery had one or more forward observers that could be attached to combat units. No, this was just a first glance at German artillery in World War II. If you want to see more on this topic, be sure to share or directly support this channel. If you like my work, consider supporting me on PayPal, Patreon or Subscribestar. Big thank you here to all my supporters that allowed me to spend time and money into acquiring and looking into various primary sources. As always, they are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.